Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 370, Dr. Stephen Nemish's Formal Challenge to Trinity Theories. Dr. Stephen Nemish is a dynamic, young, philosophical theologian. Since getting his PhD in theology from Fuller Theological Seminary, he's published at an incredible rate. His books include Orthodoxy and Heresy, Theology of the Manifest, Christianity Without Metaphysics, Theological Authority in the Church, Reconsidering Traditionalism and Hierarchy, and he has a forthcoming book entitled Eating Christ's Flesh, A Case for Memorialism. But he's here today to discuss his recently published book called Trinity and Incarnation, A Post-Catholic Theology. Dr. Nemish, welcome back to the Trinity's podcast. Thank you for having me. So we're here today to talk about your new book, Trinity and Incarnation, A Post-Catholic Theology. Dr. Nemish, in what sense is this a post-Catholic theology? What do you mean by that? So when I say Catholic... I refer to a certain mainstream tradition of Christian theology that first distinguished itself in the second and third centuries from other so-called heretical and, and Gnostic groups as being truly apostolic by means of Episcopal succession. So the Catholics in the second and third centuries defined themselves as being truly apostolic Christians because they held the theology supposedly taught by a succession of bishops and all the major churches that were thought to be founded by apostles. And then this same mainstream of Christian theology later in the fourth through eighth centuries codified and solidified certain essential dogmatic commitments in the ecumenical councils and also enforce them through the assistance of the emperor. So when I talk about Catholic Christianity with a lowercase c, I don't mean Roman Catholicism per se, but rather this mainstream of uh, mere Christianity, as a lot of people sometimes call it, that is the common inheritance of Roman Catholicism, but also Eastern Orthodoxy and more traditional forms of Protestantism, even in the present day. And so when I talk about my theology as being post-Catholic, I mean that I am consciously reacting to and moving beyond this Catholic tradition and its distinct theological commitments. Uh, so my theology is a post-Catholic theology because I'm responding to and trying to go past the Catholic theological central commitments and you know, trying to solve various problems that I think it runs into almost inevitably. Okay. So I think that's something a lot of Bible-oriented Protestants or other Christians could be interested in, and I certainly am myself. So what we're going to focus on in this episode is a very interesting challenge to kind of the whole range of Trinity theories based on Catholic, in the sense we just explained, Catholic assumptions about God. So what are those assumptions? Well, there are three distinct elements of the Catholic doctrine of God that were more or less taken for granted by all the major figures in the Catholic tradition, such as Athanasius or the Cappadocians or John Chrysostom or others, Augustine. These are the doctrine of divine simplicity, divine transcendence, and creation out of nothing, or creatio ex nihilo. Divine simplicity is the idea that God is a purely actual and undifferentiated reality. So you cannot analyze God in terms of various distinct features like you would for us. For example, I have a body. I also maybe have a soul. Um, I have arms. I have legs. I have hair. I have various qualities. I you know, have a certain personality. You can kind of make distinctions within my being, so to speak, between these properties and those properties, different ways that I am that are all distinct from each other and sort of come together to make the composite someone that I am. Uh, in the case of divine simplicity, God is not like that. You cannot really distinguish within God between this or that quality of his. He's just a pure undifferentiated reality that is self-subsistent and self-existing. Um, and he doesn't have composition within him. Now, a lot of times people will define divine simplicity by saying that it means that God is without parts, both material and metaphysical and so on. Mm -hmm. I think that this is a less clear way of speaking because most people, when you talk about parts, 
they just immediately think like detachable parts, like the parts of a Lego toy or the parts of a car. But in the metaphysical tradition that divine simplicity comes out of, even distinct aspects of things that can be distinguished from one another, but that somehow go together to compose a person or a being, those are also talked about as parts. So for example, you can distinguish within me between the ways that I actually am and the potentialities that exist in me to be different. So for example, I'm actually seated, but I'm potentially standing. I'm actually satisfied, but I'm potentially hungry and so on. All of these differences within me would count as parts in the looser sense of the word part that is uh, intended in the metaphysical tradition. But some people don't like to think about those things as parts. And so I just prefer to say that for the doctrine of divine simplicity, God is a pure and undifferentiated actuality. There's no distinguishing within him detachable pieces or parts or different aspects or modes or dimensions or anything. It's just pure reality that is not further definable. Right. Okay. That's kind of a mind melter, but I think we get the basic idea. Yeah. So the next idea is divine transcendence uh, and creation ex nihilo. And these two actually go together. The idea of creation ex nihilo is the idea that when God brings other things into existence, he does not do that by acting upon a prior medium of any kind. And that means that there is no stuff outside of God just sort of waiting to be formed. There's no like primordial matter of any kind that God shapes like a, like a potter. But neither does God create by acting on himself. Like he doesn't create, for example, by growing limbs or like a, a tree, for example, grows branches and then out of the branches come leaves and shoots and so on. God doesn't create in that way either. He doesn't expand himself when he creates and neither does he act on something outside of himself. He just purely causes something to exist without there being anything whatsoever to act as the, what we might call the material cause mm -hmm. uh, for that things existing ahead of time. Without there being anything whatsoever outside of him and without acting upon himself, he simply causes a thing to exist in its own right. And that's the idea of creation ex nihilo. And obviously together with this is the idea that God transcends the created world because it's not a part of him. Transcendence means that God is beyond the world of created things. You're not going to find him within it. He's not one more created thing. But it also means in the classical tradition that God is not even similar to created things. They are characterizable in certain terms. One way, for example, of characterizing created things is that they're all composite. You can distinguish within created things between the ways they are and the ways they could be, you know, their general essence and then their particularity, the thing that makes them individuals, various properties that they have and powers and dispositions and so on. Well, God is nothing like that. And so another sense of divine transcendence is not only the idea that God causes things to exist outside of himself rather than causing them to exist as his own parts, but it's also the idea that he's not even characterizable in the same terms as anything that is created. So there's a created way of being, and then there's God's way of being. These are incommensurate. Uh, that's the idea of divine transcendence. These three ideas go together in what the philosopher and theologian Robert Sokolowski calls the Christian distinction between God and the world. This is his way of summarizing the essentially Catholic idea of how God relates to the world. There's a distinction between God and the world, and this means that God is not in the world. He's not a part of the world. The world is not a part of him. He does not change when the world comes into existence. He could exist and be perfectly self-identical even if there was no world, and so on. Right. Okay, so you've got those three popular theological assumptions and I noticed as this argument moves along, it also does refer to the concept of processions within the Trinity. So why don't we just mm -hmm. quickly say what those are too? According to the classical tradition, the only ways in which Father, Son, and Spirit are distinguished from one another is by their interpersonal relations. So the only thing distinguishing the Father from the Son is the fact that the Father begets the Son and the Son is begotten by the Father. But with respect to anything else, they have it in common. So, for example, there is between the Father and the Son a single knowledge, a single will, a single power, a single whatever other quality or dimension of divine being you want to think of. They have one and the same instance of that. The only way that the Father and the Son are distinguished is their interpersonal relation of being begetter and begotten. And something similar is said also about the Holy Spirit. So this implies that there is a kind of a unidirectional priority, in a sense, between Father and Son. Mm -hmm. The Father is prior to the Son. The Son is posterior to the Father. The Father himself is prior to everything. Nothing is posterior to him. He's sort of like the absolute source of everything whatsoever. Yeah. So it's not supposed to be creation, but it's supposed to be some sort of sourcing or causing. Right. 
in the loosest possible way that these words can be interpreted. Right. What makes this argument so interesting is it's what I would call formal. We're going to refer to two of the key terms of traditional Trinity theories, and these terms can be interpreted in many different ways. But the interesting thing is the argument doesn't depend on particular interpretations of these two terms. So those terms are in Greek, and correct me if, if my pronunciation is not what you prefer, but I say usia and hypostases. Yeah, that's fine. Usia is singular, and hypostasis would be singular also. And then in the plural, it would be hypostasis. So when you make the word plural, you have to move the accent over to the second to last syllable. Mm -hmm. um, but in the singular, it would be hypostasis, yeah. Mm -hmm. Without going into too much detail, like how would those normally be translated in Trinitarian theology? Usia is normally translated either being or nature or essence along those lines or substance. Mm -hmm. Whereas hypostasis is typically translated as person. So the idea is that God is one usia in three hypostasis, which means he's one being in three persons or one nature in three persons or one substance in three persons. Right. Uh, there's more uniformity about the translation of hypostasis than there is about the translation of usia. Okay. And then there's one more tool we have to put on the table to understand how this argument works, which is the concept of metaphysical priority. So can you explain mm -hmm. that? Yeah, when I talk about priority in the book, I mean just in the broadest possible sense of one directional because ofness, if you want to call it that. So, for example, anything that uh, explains something else is prior to it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you put water in a pot over a campfire, the heat of the fire is prior to the boiling of the water because it explains it. It's causally prior. Mm hmm. But you can also have priority in a sort of a non-causal sense, maybe in a, in a looser sense of the word priority. For example, you might think that my being a human being is prior to my speaking English, because in order for me to speak English, I have to have the capacity to learn language. And the fact that I have the capacity to learn language is explained by my possessing a human nature. So my possession of human nature is prior in that sense to my capacity to speak English. But this is not really like a causal priority. Uh, it could be if you want to define the word cause loosely enough. Uh, but this is a kind of a, a different sort of ontological or metaphysical or explanatory priority that is not exactly the same as, you know, fire causing a pot of water to boil. But yeah. this also would be priority in the sense that I mean it. Okay. So priority meaning more fundamental or more basic. And so whatever is, pri if A is prior to B, then A can be what explains B or part of what explains B. So it's not only fundamentality, but it's also, like I said, because of this. Uh -huh. It's in actual fact, A explains B. Yeah. Uh, a is prior to B because actually B is because of A. Okay, so it's an explanatory concept, and the explainer gets called prior, and the explained thing gets called posterior or later. Right. Later, but not later in time, necessarily. Not necessarily later in time, right. Yeah, yeah, okay. When the Trendies podcast returns we start to explore Dr. Nemish's interesting challenge to Trinity theories. So the way this argument works, I would call it a four-part destructive quadrilemma. Right? A dilemma just has two cases. This has four cases. Yeah, so this would be a tetralemma. What did I say? Quadrilemma, isn't that? Yeah, because quad is Latin. So this would be a tetralemma. Oh, yeah. I should mix my Latin and Greek. What an idiot. Okay. You're exactly right. Um, well, you have the bad luck of, <laughs> of doing this with somebody who teaches Latin and Greek. So. That's right. <laughs> That's why I'm happy to be corrected. So, I mean, this kind of destructive argument, you're showing that something bad happens no matter which branch we go down, basically. So, right. you know, what is that bad thing that's going to result uh, no matter what we say about usia and hypostasis? The basic structure of my argument is that it asks a question of how the usia and the hypostasis 
whatever these are supposed to mean, relate to each other. And no matter which option you take, you are going to be compromising somewhere or other on another commitment of Catholic theology. So I say that there are four possibilities for understanding the relation between usia and hypostasis. One possibility is that the usia is prior to each hypostasis. Another possibility is that the hypostases are prior to the usia. Mm -hmm. uh, a third possibility is that the usia and the hypostases are uh, what I call coeval or simultaneous with one another and yet distinct. And then the fourth possibility is that the usia and the hypostases somehow are identified with one another or collapse into one another somehow. Mm -hmm. So in more informal terms, you can say that the usia comes before the hypostases or the hypostases come before the usia or the usia and the hypostases are all alongside each other. Or you can say that the usia and the hypostases just are each other. And so those are the four different ways that they could relate to each other. I mean, those seem like the only four possible ways given that we understand this concept of priority. That's what I would say also. But I find that in these discussions, people are clever and they would sooner admit ignorance of metaphysical necessities than to give up their, <laughs> their preferred doctrines. Yeah. Uh, so for the sake of avoiding an argument, I don't say that these are necessarily the only four ways. Although I think at one point in the book, I mentioned that there don't seem to be other possibilities beyond these. Yeah. But these ones are at least clear possibilities and none of them work out. And it's hard to see what other possibilities there might be. Yeah. And if so, that's bad for what you could call a Catholic agenda for understanding God. Because right. with those assumptions that we talked about, if you end up with something self-contradictory or otherwise problematic, whichever direction you turn, it looks like you need to go back to the drawing board and reconsider some of your fundamental assumptions. Yeah, I think that the basic conclusion that I would like people to draw from this segment of my book is that Catholic theology is a lot of moving pieces. There are a lot of different ideas and commitments that are at work here. And when you zoom out a little bit and see the big picture, you get the impression of a machine that's kind of like broken and working against itself. Like one part is doing this, but another part is doing something else. And so it, it can't function well. That's my conviction about Catholic theology. I think that you have fundamentally contradictory ideas and impulses and forces at work that you can only really appreciate the contradiction if you zoom out a little bit and try to see the whole picture and you or you're not satisfied with just, you know, simple answers to the obvious questions to ask. Mm -hmm. So what I was trying to do with this book is to try to show the big picture and to try to show how the Catholic doctrine of God does not allow you actually to come up with an intelligible and coherent interpretation of the verbal formulas of Trinity and Incarnation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and as we'll talk about in next week's podcast episode, you know, thinking that the whole agenda runs into some serious problems, this is one reason to maybe want to revisit some of their interpretations of the New Testament and see if we've gone wrong there somewhere. Certainly. So let's go to the first of the four cases where the divine usia is prior to each of the hypostases. Well, the obvious problem there is that if you say that the usia is prior to the hypostases, then the father has an origin. And yet the father is not supposed to have an origin. He's mm -hmm. not supposed to be anything behind the father because he's supposed to be ungenerated and uncaused. And that's his personal property by which he's distinguished from the son and the Holy Spirit. But again, priority means because of this. So if the father is because of something, then that would put a father beh behind the father, so to speak. There would be two fathers in the Trinity. That's not what Catholic theologians want in their doctrine of the Trinity. And so you cannot say that the usia is prior to the hypostasis. Yeah, that seems like a pretty bad problem. Another problem that arises for the same theory is that if you say that the usia is prior to the hypostasis, that means that all the hypostases are distinct from the usia because a thing cannot be prior to itself. Now, if there is a distinction between the Father and the Usia, and let's just for the moment define the Usia as the divine nature or the essence or whatever, then you have, how is it that the Usia comes to be instantiated in the case of the Father? Because in the ordinary case, natures are indifferent to the existence or non-existence of the particulars that exemplify them. So I'll try to explain that. It makes no difference to the nature of catness or cathood or felinity whether any particular cat exists. There's no necessary connection between catness in general in the abstract and then this particular cat that you might see here. That means that if you do have a particular cat, 
the nature by itself is not enough to explain why that cat exists. You have to appeal to something else. Well, if you say that the divine nature is prior to the person of the father, well, natures are indifferent to the persons or the individuals that instantiate them. And so that means that you have to have an explanation for how the divine nature comes to be instantiated in the father. And the father would need to have a cause. But this is exactly what Catholic theology tries to avoid through its doctrine of divine simplicity. It tries to say that there is no distinction between nature and individual in the case of God. He just is his own nature. And so that means that you cannot say that the nature is prior to the person of the father because otherwise he would be distinct from the nature and then you would have this problem of explaining how the father comes about. Mm -hmm. So this is another problem that arises if you take this path. And then the final problem that I mentioned in my book is that this way of thinking about the relationship between the usia and the hypostasis actually undercuts a certain rule in theology called Rahner's rule. And this rule says that the economic trinity is the imminent trinity. Now, what does that mean? That means that the Trinitarian expression or mode of being that God has in history reflects who God is in his own being. So there's a kind of an analogy between the historical manifestation of the Trinity in time and the eternal inner being of the Trinity. Now, in time, what happens is that the Father sends the Son. And so following Rahner's rule, the inference to make from this is that there is a relationship of priority between father and son within the Trinity itself. So this is where the idea of the processions come from. There's an internal procession that mirrors or is analogous to the external procession of the father sending the son in history. But if you say that the usia is prior to the persons, the hypostasis, then there's something in the inner being of God that does not have a corollary in history. Because the father himself would have a cause and he would have an origin, but there is nothing in history that you know suggests this or, or mirrors this. What is more, it would strictly speaking be inaccurate to say that the father is the cause of the son because the both of them together would come from the usia. And so there would be no reason to say one is father and one is son when the both of them have a shared origin in something else. Mm. So the idea that the usia is prior to the hypostasis not only raises various metaphysical problems, but it also undermines the intelligibility of the Trinitarian language because the father and the son would not be father and son to each other, but rather they would both come out of the same origin. All right. Those sound like some pretty bad problems. I mean, I could imagine some of my analytic theology friends making various moves to try to get around it. They could deny simplicity or they could deny processions. It strikes me that denying the processions is a lot harder to do if you're trying to adhere to mainstream tradition. But um, yeah, that looks like all around a bad option. I mean, you're going to have the father not being the ultimate. He's going to be explained by something else, which is going to be ultimate. And right, yeah, how can he be the one God, like the creed says, if there's this something else that's prior to him that explains his existence? When the Turandis podcast returns, what if we try the opposite? What if we say that the hypostases are prior to the usia? So what if we try it the other way around, Dr. Nemish, and say that the divine hypostases are prior to the divine usia? Well, the problem then is that there is no divine usia until all the hypostases exist, right? Because they together bring about the usia. Just like there's no house until you have all the pieces of the house put together in the proper order. But this implies that before there are the three of them, there is no usia. And that means that there is no usia that the father shares with his son, because it's not that the father already has an usia and then he shares his prior usia with the son. There is no usia until the father, the son, and the Holy Spirit are all together brought about. If there is a, an usia shared between father and son, it's a different usia than the one that they all bring about. Mm. And so there's a father nature and a son nature, but then the nature of the Trinity is different from the father and the son nature. Yeah. So either you have two natures in God, 
or the other way around, to say that the father is prior to the usia is to say that the father considered in himself has no usia. But again, in normal circumstances, usia is translated nature or being. And to say that the father has in himself no being or no nature is to say that he's just a bare particular. He's just a bare individuated X with no content. But something like that cannot bring about anything else, right? You cannot say that the father is the explanation of the son because he has to at least have such a nature as would allow him to be the explanation of something. Right. Uh, but if there is no nature until the father, son, and Holy Spirit are all around, then he cannot be the explanation of anything. A bare particular cannot explain anything. Yeah. And so the problem with putting the persons prior to the, the nature, the problem with putting the usia posterior to the hypostasis is that each hypostasis considered in himself no longer has an usia, and therefore he can't do anything. He cannot be the explanation of anything else. Mm -hmm. Neither is, an, is there an usia that they're all sharing with each other. In objecting to this case, you're using words like before and until, but you're not saying that on this option, the hypostasis would literally exist before the usia. You're using before in this metaphysical sense, like we discussed. Right. I don't mean temporally before. I mean yeah. in terms of priority, uh, in terms of like metaphysical priority. Yeah. So it seems like the culprit here again would be incompatibility with the divine processions as taught by the mainstream. Yeah. I mean, you know, so for example, the Council of Nicaea says that the father begets his son out of his nature, right? Or the son is begotten out of the nature of the father or out of the usias of the father. But if the usia is posterior to all three hypostases, then there is no usia there from which the son would be begotten of the father, right? So this, mm -hmm. this option is contrary to Nicaea because Nicaea's language presupposes that the father already has an usia, and then it is out of that usia that the son is begotten. But if you put the usia posterior to all the hypostases, then it's not there when the, when the son is begotten. It's only there once the son is begotten and somehow the, the Holy Spirit proceeds too. And then from all three of them, there comes the usia. Yeah. So this option is, again, inconsistent with the logic of the Nicene Creed. Mm -hmm. Not Nicene Constantinopolitan, but the Nicene 325 Creed. Yeah. Yeah, I think they got rid of that language in the 381 version because of a concern about suggesting that the divine usia was material or something. But, I mean, it seems to me anybody who believes in processions thinks that the Father, so to speak, first has the divine essence. And then because of that, he's able to give it to the Son so that the son also has it. But then, right. yeah, you can't have all three hypostases being prior to the essence, if that's true. Right. They cannot be prior to anything without having an essence. They need to have an essence, which defines their being and makes a certain range of activities possible for them. And then they can be the explanation of other things. But without an essence, they're nothing. They're just bare individuals with no properties or powers or anything at all. Yeah, which seems unsuited to be the explanation of anything. Right. Yeah. Uh, the second case, I think, is easier to set aside. Well, I will mention this here. We, I think we'll come back to it. But I will mention that there is a certain argument that John of Damascus gives. And I remember when I first came across this passage, I put it in a paper that I wrote for a systematic theology class that I took during my MDiv. And it was a class with Oliver Crisp, whom you know. Mm -hmm. And Oliver quite liked the paper. So I argued against social Trinitarian theories, drawing from a passage in John of Damascus. And John of Damascus says that, I'm paraphrasing now, a composite item is not called by the same name as the individual items. And the individual items that go to make up a composite may be complete or perfect as the sort of thing that they are as individuals, but they are only imperfect from the point of view of the composite. So I'll give an example. A house made of bricks is a house but the individual bricks that make up the house are not themselves each a house. They're at best part of a house. But they are individually bricks, and the whole house is not together a brick. So the composite object has one sort of essence. The individual part has another kind of essence. And the individual part can be incomplete or a part from the point of view of the whole, uh, but it is not the same sort of thing as the whole. And the whole, again, is a different kind of thing from the part. So, for example, my bones may be imperfectly human in the sense that they are human bones, but they're not a human body. And my human body has bones as parts, but it's not a, itself a bone, right? It's a body. So the whole has one name and the parts have another name. Now, the problem is that if you say that the usia is 
posterior to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as the hypostasis, then the question arises, what sort of a thing are the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and what sort of a thing is the usia, which comes about as a result of them? If the usia is all three of them together, then each individual hypostasis is not the usia, but it's a part of it, right? They're sort of a part of a composite whole. Mm -hmm. And that means that the, the usia is one sort of thing and the individual parts is another. So that means that the nature of the Trinity is different from the nature of the Father, in which case the Father is a different sort of thing than the Trinity, which is perhaps problematic. Chad McIntosh, for example, in a, an article about social Trinitarianism of some kind or other, he argues that God can be conceived of as a group person, whereas the individual persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are what he calls intrinsicist persons. Mm -hmm. But this is just the same thing as saying that God is a different sort of thing than the Father. The Father is a person, as a, an intrinsicist person, and then God, as the Trinity, is a group person, and the Father is a part of that group, but a group is a different sort of thing than an individual. You know, a football team is not the same sort of thing as a player, and a player is at best a part of a team and not the whole team. So that means that if you take this point of view, you know, you think that the Trinity is somehow emergent from the persons, or the, the one divine being is emergent from the three persons, then you have the consequence that God is a different sort of thing than the Father, which again is contrary to Nicaea, which says, I believe in one God, the Father. Yeah. You will have some Trinitarians who will bite this bullet, like, for instance, William Hasker, I think, and I think this comes out in the debate book that we're all finishing up writing right now. I think he wants to say that the tripersonal God is a God, whereas none of the divine persons is a God. The tripersonal one usia has the kind God, whereas the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit ha only have the kind divine person, mm -hmm. and that doesn't entail being a God. But yeah, it's hard to see how this would be compatible with the tradition for the reasons you said. And also, you know, some other Trinitarians are going to say, no, no, each one of them is a God. It's just that they're the same God. So... <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I would say this about Hasker. If you say that only the Trinity is God and not the Father, then you are as uncatholic as I am, because the Nicene <laughs> Creed says, I believe in one God, the Father. Yeah. So the Father is the one God. And the you know, the, the Athanasian Creed, even though that's not an ecumenical creed, nevertheless, it also says the Father is God. So if you're going to take that route, I mean, that's a way of making the theory philosophically invulnerable to certain kinds of critiques, but theologically, it's a, it's a bridge too far yeah. because you've departed from the norms that are provided by the creeds. Yeah, well, that's a whole other can of worms, you know, quite how to interpret these and again, it's the interesting thing about this argument that it kind of sidesteps quite exactly how we interpret these two terms. It's a formal problem that looks like it's really hard to solve. When the Trinity's podcast returns, what if the usia and the hypostasis are neither prior to nor posterior to one another? So why don't we go on to the third case on which the usia and the hypostasis are, in your words, co-evil? Yeah, so I say that a third possibility for understanding is to say that the usia and the hypostasis are co-evil and distinct from one another. To say that they're co-evil is to say that none of them is prior to the other. They're mm -hmm. sort of simultaneous with one another. Mm -hmm. And to say that they're distinct is to say that they're not identical. This implies that basically what we have here are four things. For example, you can have four cats walking down the road. Those cats are coeval and distinct. They're coeval in the sense that none of the cats is prior to the others, and they're distinct in the sense that each one is different from the other. So that means you have four things. If you were to say that the usia and the three distinct hypostases are coeval and distinct, then you have four things. You don't have one God. You have just four things. And this is obviously irreconcilable with the idea that there's only one God. Because there's not one God if all you have are four coeval and distinct things. Four things cannot be one thing. And so this is just totally a non-starter. Right, because it's four things that belong to the same ontological category. 
and this is whatever ontological category the one God is in, but then you should have one and not four, <laughs> right? right? Yeah, yeah. That seems yeah. I mean, you like can, a hard you can problem. Do different examples. For example, you could choose four of my accidental properties: the color of my skin, the shape of my body, the color of my hair, and some other thing. From the point of view of their being as accidental properties, they're coeval with each other. Mm -hmm. And they're also distinct. They're coeval because no one of them is prior to or more fundamental than the other. These are just properties that I have. And they're all sort of on a plane. And they're also distinct because the one is not reducible to the others. And so those are just four things. I have four properties. The point about coevality doesn't mean that the three persons and the usia are somehow all like fundamental substances or something. The whole point is just that no one of them is prior to the others. Mm -hmm. There are four things that are simultaneous, ontologically speaking. They're coeval. No one is prior to the others, and they're also distinct from each other. And that's just the same thing as four things, whether it be four properties or four cats walking down the road or four sides of a cube or whatever. Yeah, and it's supposed to be an account of God <laughs> when you just fundamentally have four things. Yeah, that looks like not a three one too many. There. Yeah, yeah, three exactly. too many. Yeah, that seems pretty bad. Uh, what else do you want to say on this third case before we go on to the, I think, more complicated fourth case? One reason why you could not say that the usia and the hypostasis are all coeval and distinct with one another is because the hypostasis are not supposed to be coeval. The father is supposed to be prior to the son. The son is son because he's begotten of the father, and the father begets the son and the spirit proceeds from the father, or possibly from the father and the son. So according to the classical doctrine, the persons themselves, the hypostases, cannot be coeval. So this is just another non-starter. Okay, so it looks like we've run into pretty bad problems, whether we want to say the usia is, so to speak, first, or the hypostases are first, or neither one are first. Those three options involve the usia and the hypostases being distinct. So what if in some sense they're not distinct? Somehow it's all the same. Let's talk about that. The way I looked at your chapter here, Dr. Nemish, I kind of saw three different subcases here to consider. Mm -hmm. So one possibility is to say that the usia just reduces to the three hypostases. There is no usia above and beyond or... You know, mm -hmm. over and above the hypostases. Mm -hmm. But insofar as the hypostases are distinct from one another, that means that you either have three gods or you are somehow thinking of the one god as like the collection of them. And this again runs into the problems that I mentioned earlier, drawing from John of Damascus. If you have three cats in front of you and you think that, you know, what's the name for a, a group of cats? Oh, gee, I don't know. <laughs> a herd? Let's say it's a pack of cats, a herd of cats herding cats. <laughs> if you have a herd of cats in front of you, right, and the herd is nothing more than the cats, and each of the cats are distinct from one another, let's say you have, you know, this cat is not that cat, and neither of those two cats are the other cat, then you have three cats. So if you have three divine persons, and the divine usia is nothing more than the divine persons, and the divine persons are distinct from each other, then you just have three gods, and there's not really a way around it. You know, they can relate to each other as closely as you'd like, and they can have, you know, they can really love one another and get along swimmingly, but there's still three gods at the end of the day, because they're just three distinct divine persons. We could at this point also return to John of Damascus's argument. We can ask, okay, let's say we have the usia, and then we have the hypostases. The hypostases are distinct from one another, and the usia some, somehow reduces to the hypostases. Um, either you have three gods, or else you think that all of them together somehow make up the one God. But because this turns the whole into something more than each individual item, then the Father is not God, but only a part of God. And the Son likewise is not God, but only a part of God. And then you turn God into a composite object, uh, because you say that the three of them together are God, and yet the three of them are nevertheless distinct from each other. And there is no other way to make sense of that except to say that God is a composite object of which each individual person is a part. Mm -hmm. And then once more, because composites have a different nature than their parts, that means that God has a different nature than the Father. And that's problematic. Yeah, Dr. Nemesh, as I was reading through this chapter, I was thinking about this principle that you find in John of Damascus. The way that you sum it up on page 42 is you say, one and the same name cannot be applied both to a compound of things 
and to the individual things constituting the compound. And I uh, cooked up my own counterexample to this. All right, suppose I have three blobs of clay and I kind of gently mash them together. It looks like I have a hole, which is a fourth larger blob of clay, and it has three blobs of clay as parts. And then it looks like the same name could be applied to each part, but also to the whole, namely blob of clay. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about that? Is that a counterexample that shows that this principle isn't perfectly general? For my part, I'm not inclined to agree with the counterexample. I don't think that if you put three blobs of clay together, then you get a, a, a single blob of clay. It depends whether they're separable or whether they so blend with one another that to break them apart, you would have to tear them and you would produce like a tear in the fabric of the clay. So long as they're just like separable but sticking together, I don't think that you have one blob of clay. I think you have three of them together. If they do become sort of blended with one another, then you have one blob of clay, but you no longer have three parts. You just have a single blob. I would also note that there are certain words in our language um, that we use that don't really imply a lot of content. They're just useful for calling a thing something that we can refer to. So for example, thing, mm -hmm. right? You can call a whole and its parts a thing, but thing is a word so empty of content that if I call something a thing, that doesn't really tell you what it is, except that it's something that I can refer to. Yeah. If I were to call something a house, that's a little bit more. That's a richer notion. It has more content. And in that case, we can see that the parts of a house are not themselves houses. Neither is a house a brick, but a house, even if it's made out of bricks. I think something like that may be going on with blob. Blob, to my mind, just sounds like some thing of indeterminate shape that I can refer to. Yeah, you might think it doesn't have a nature or an essence. Right. It doesn't refer to like a kind of thing. It's just mm -hmm. really like a, a general all-purpose word for referring. And so I think something like that may be going on here too. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that's not exactly a devastating counterexample, but... Anyway, even laying aside John of Damascus, I think you have other reasons to object to this. In your book, you mentioned simplicity and also an idea of deception. Right. Um, so if you were to say that the three divine hypostases are parts of God, obviously you've compromised divine simplicity, because that now means that within God, you can draw this distinction between the divine persons. Mm -hmm. Also, here I reference an article that you wrote in which it seems like God is deceiving people the way he talks in the Old Testament if actually God is not one divine person, but three persons. I don't know that I want to commit myself to this argument, but I will say that you would never get the idea reading the Old Testament when God calls himself I all the time, that somehow it's three persons speaking mm -hmm. or that it's only one of three persons speaking. You mm -hmm. don't get that impression whatsoever. You know, so I think that it would be, if not deceptive, at the very least, extremely misleading uh, for God to speak that way, if really God were three persons instead of just one person. Okay, so we've talked about one sense in which you might collapse the usia and the three hypostases, which would be saying that the usia is nothing over and above the hypostases. Of course, another way to collapse them would be to identify the usia with each one of them. And so why not do that? Well, the problem is that the hypostases are all supposed to be different from each other. And so if you identify the usia, then because identity is a transitive uh, and symmetrical relation, it follows that the hypostases all turn out to be identical with each other. So if you say that the Father is the divine nature and the Son is the divine nature and the Holy Spirit is the divine nature, then it turns out that the Father is the Son is the Holy Spirit. Unless by is, you mean something less than just straightforward identification. Mm -hmm. So you can say the Father is the divine nature seen from a certain point of view, and the Son is the divine nature seen from another point of view, and the Holy Spirit is a divine nature seen from a third point of view. But that means that there are not really real distinctions between the persons any longer. The persons are not really distinct individual existences. They are just aspects of a thing when it's looked at from a certain side. This would imply that if there was nobody to think about God, if there was nobody to see God, so to speak, from the one or the other point of view, then there would be no persons. Just like, for example, you can talk about a sunset. It's hard to define. A sunset is not an individual substance, obviously. It's the image that arises when a group of individual things are looked at from a certain point of view. Mm -hmm. If you take away the person looking, then there is no more point of view. There's no looking going on, right? And so there is no sunset. Mm -hmm. 
In the same way, if you say that the Father is the divine nature looked at from a certain point of view, then you make the Father's existence dependent on the person who's there to take that point of view. He's not there prior to that, right? He's just an aspect of the thing, and aspects imply observers. So I don't write this in my book, but uh, I do think that this would be one of the serious problems with taking this approach. Yeah, so someone who's trying to be orthodox is not going to want to make the... Uh persons just be like subjectively perceived aspects or something right. nor are they going to want to collapse them and identify the persons with each other because that would be traditionally rejected as modalism right. so yeah i mean this just looks dead end all around but you do consider one more subcase here for in some sense bringing together the usia and the hypostases what's that last attempt yeah, this is the idea of material constitution as an analogy for the Trinity. And this is an argument brought forth by Michael Ray and Jeffrey Brower. They say, for example, consider you know a hunk of marble that is formed into a statue of a goddess, and then somebody also uses it as a pillar in a temple for holding up a certain wall. It seems like you have three things there. You have the hunk of marble, you have the statue, and you have the pillar. Mm -hmm. But these three things somehow are the same and somehow are different. You can remove one or more of them without removing all of them. For example, if you remove the statue altogether from its position in the temple, then it's no longer a pillar. It's just a statue and a hunk of marble. Mm -hmm. And then you could leave it out in the open air and the wind could efface it so that the goddess's form is no longer visible. And then you no longer have a statue of a goddess. You just have a hunk of marble. Mm -hmm. So the statue, and of course, the hunk existed first before either right. or the others. So it looks like they're distinct from one another. Right. It looks like the statue and the hunk of marble and the pillar are all different things and yet somehow the same. Mm -hmm. And so some people have suggested this as an analogy for the Trinity. Right. And so they say that the hunk of marble constitutes the statue and the pillar and the statue and the pillar and marble are going to be, they say, numerically the same, but not identical to one another. So there are differences between them, such as when they came into existence and how they might go out of existence. So they can't be identical because there are differences between them. But even so, they say they're to be counted as one. They're, they're very closely right. related. And then they think that there's some analogy here for the Trinity, what they are trying to suggest with this is that somehow you can say that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are all the same while being distinct from each other. And this is supposed to provide a, an analogy for that way of speaking. But to my mind, it doesn't work for the reason that the only way that you can have these sorts of cases is when you have a distinction between a real object and then what I call irreal objects or objects that you know are basically a result of using something in a certain way or ascribing a certain meaning to it. For example, I say in my book that there's no real thing called a statue. Mm -hmm. A statue is a real object, a piece of metal or of rock of some kind that is being put to a certain use. But as soon as it's no longer being put to that use, then there's no statue anymore. You know, and apart from that meaning being assigned to it by the people who use it, it's not a statue. So, for example, for cats, there are no statues or for dogs, right? There are just different hard surfaces in their environments that they use to climb up or to scratch their fur against and things like that. But there is no statue for a cat. There's only a statue for a human being. And this means that the statue is not a real object. A statue is a real object that is being put to a certain use. There's this act of meaning assignation, if you want to call it that, that's involved in the existence of the statue. Mm -hmm. uh, it's only there for as long as somebody is giving it this meaning. If every human being died and there were no longer any human beings on earth to call things statues, there would be no statues. There would just be metal or stone objects that have a certain shape. It's only that way that you can have these cases of material constitution. It's only if you can have a single real object that is being put to multiple uses at the same time that you can say that somehow there are three or four or five or however many things there. But there's always going to be one real object and the rest of them are going to be unreal objects. They're going to be irreal sort of like social objects or, or socially constructed objects. They're kind of as if realities yeah, based on kind of human imagination. So it's like, I don't know if this is a good analogy for what you're talking about, but imagine a little boy picks a rock up off the ground and says, look, dad, this is an airplane. And he's flying it around, right? And it's an airplane to him. You could say, right. but 
I mean, it's still just whatever it was before, objectively. Right. And then he gets distracted. He sees a squirrel and he drops the rock and no airplane has gone out of existence here, right? right. Nor did anyone come into existence. It's just... Not a real airplane anyway. Yeah. Well, it was a real yeah. rock, but it wasn't ever a real airplane. Right. And so what I'm suggesting is that statues, strictly speaking, are these make-believe objects. What's really there is marble or stone or concrete or whatever, or bronze. But the statue is not that. The statue is this make-believe object. It's a real item being given a certain meaning by somebody. And so that's why in the case of the Trinity, you cannot have this because the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are supposed to be real individual existence. They are not make-believe objects. They're not subjective objects. They're real individual subsistences, to use the more traditional language, that are supposed to have real existence that's distinct from one another. But you cannot have a case of real subsistences that are, you know, share a material constitution, but are somehow distinct from one another. Unless you have like a case of like a person with two heads. But in order to have that, you need material composition. The only way that you can have a person with two heads is if you have matter to form in that way. And you can put one head here and one head there. But God is not supposed to have any matter, right? That would be contrary to the divine simplicity. Yeah. So I think that the case of material constitution just doesn't work. I say in my book, as Vladimir Lossky writes, the doctrine of the Trinity has one term for what is common or one, namely usia, and another for what is three, namely hypostasis. And yet, there is no case of material constitution in which this same formal pattern arises. What one has in the example provided by Brouwer and Ray is not one X and three Ys, but rather an X, a Y, and a Z, for example, a slab, a statue, and a pillar, that are all somehow the same. Indeed, to speak of three distinct Ys that are all somehow the same thing would be impossible. Three slabs cannot really be the same thing any more than three statues or three pillars could be the same thing. As soon as one speaks of three X's or three Y's, it would seem that one is speaking of three distinct things. So this is an, a further problem with Brower and Ray's proposal. They have three different names here. There's slab, statue, pillar. Whereas in the Trinity, the case of the Trinity, you have one name that is equally applicable to each of the three persons, namely person. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to have one person, a second person, and a third person. But there is no case of material constitution where you have that. Right. So really, this is kind of a, it's, it's an irrelevant example, because the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are supposed to be the same kind of thing, namely persons. Yeah. I have a whole article on this. I mean, it's a strange proposal in that the Trinity turns out to be very complex. I think I count seven different things that they're talking about that have to be distinct from one another. And yet, they keep telling us that some of these things are to be counted as one. It's like, well, I could... <laughs> I can see that they're not one and the same. So why are you telling me to count them as one? Like, yeah. uh, you know, they would push back about the case of the pillar. They think you really do have to have a concept of constitution just for the metaphysics of material objects. I mean, look, this isn't obvious either. If you have a slab and the statue and the pillar and all of these are real and each of them weighs 500 pounds, but they're different from one another. Why is it that when we put this seemingly one thing on the scale, we only get 500 pounds and not 1,500 pounds? Right. But they are, well, that, that's just how constitution works, I guess. But yeah, this hasn't met with a lot of friendly reception among theologians, I wouldn't say. To my mind, it just seems obvious that a, a pillar and a statue are not real objects, not by themselves anyway. They are rather ways that we use real objects, in which case you don't have an analogy. Yeah. I mean, they would point out that we do talk as if artifacts are real things, you know, like phones, for instance, or shoes. But um, yeah, so if we're supposed to count these things as one, I mean, they still look like they're different <laughs> and that they're not identical because this isn't right. the previous option that we discussed. But also what they suggest is that the divine usia constitutes each of the divine persons but then that would be back to the case, I think, of the Usia being prior to the three hypostases. And then, I mean, right. that's just the first case that we talked about with all the problems that that involves. So it right. looks like it's it might collapse back into the first case that we talked about. But if it counts as this fourth case, that in some sense there's not a difference between the Usia and the hypostases, well, it still bristles with metaphysical problems. Agreed. When the Trendies podcast returns, Dr. Nemesh and I discuss another problem that he raises in this chapter, 
which is whether or not, for the Trinitarian, divinity is supposed to imply being tripersonal. Dr. Nemish, we've gone through that main argument that we wanted to discuss, the formal argument, but in your chapter, you also raise a topic that's come up in some other recent literature about Trinity theories, and that is the difficult question, is tripersonality implied by divinity or not? And it kind of looks like there's going to be trouble either way. So suppose we say that divinity does imply tripersonality. Part of what it is to be God or a God is to be tripersonal. What's the problem with that? The problem with that is that it implies that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit do not themselves possess the entire divine nature Mm. insofar as they also don't subsist in three persons. Mm -hmm. Uh, So one way of understanding this is as follows. Is it a part of human nature to have bones or not? Yes, it is but my bones don't have bones, right? They just are the bones. And so my bones do not possess the whole of human nature. They only possess a part of it. Mm -hmm. It would be better to say that my bones are a part of a complete nature rather than that they are the whole of it. So also, if subsisting in three persons is part of what it means to be divine, then neither Father nor Son nor Holy Spirit is divine in the full sense because they don't subsist in three persons. Rather, they would just be the parts of the divine nature that subsist in three persons. And this means that they don't possess the whole divine nature, they only possess a part of it, which again is contrary to the doctrine of divine simplicity, because there is not supposed to be a whole and part relationship within God. And it's also contrary to Nicene theology, which says that between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, all things are shared, and they all possess the entire divine nature, and the only distinctions are their interpersonal relations. Mm -hmm. The pro-Nicene position is that the whole divine nature is equally shared by Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's what makes them all to be divine. But the only way that that can be true is if it's not actually a part of the divine nature to subsist in three persons, because then they would also have to subsist in three persons. Right. That looks like a Nicene disaster. You know, if they're all supposed to be fully divine now, it looks like none of them would be fully divine. Okay, so that's the problem if tripersonality is implied by divinity. What if we say that tripersonality is not implied by divinity? If you say that tripersonal existence is not implied by divinity, then you have to answer the question of how it is that God actually subsists tripersonally. And there are two possibilities. It could be a matter of brute fact, or it could be a matter of the Father's will. The brute fact explanation is unfortunate because, you know, basically you would have a breakdown in the intelligibility of things if you have three persons there, but there's no explanation for why. Yeah, plus it'd be against processions. Yeah, and it would be against the processions, because then there would be an explanation for why there's more than one person. But if you say that it's a matter of the Father's will, then that implies that God did not have to be triune, in which case the idea that the processions owe to the Father's will is precisely the Arian idea that the Nicene theologians were trying to combat. Now, this idea does have a lot of traditional support, for example, in Novation or Tertullian, Mm -hmm. and these other figures will say openly that the Son is begotten of the Father's will, Mm -hmm. but the Nicene theologians rejected that. They wanted to say, no, the Father is always Father, therefore he always has a Son. You know, ek te susias tu patros, as the language of the Nicene Creed. It's out of the being of the Father that the Son is begotten, and not by the Father's will, right? It's just his nature as Father to beget a Son. And so whether you say it's a brute fact or whether you say that it's a matter of the Father's will, both of those are heretical options. Gosh, that looks like a pretty tight dilemma. And uh, I don't think there's any consensus about what to say about it. I will mention one more thing, because this is closely related. If you say that the Father produces a son out of his nature, then in order for the son to have the same nature as the Father, he also has to produce a son of his own. Because Mm -hmm. sharing in the nature of a thing means producing the sort of effects that are proper to a thing of that nature. 
just like sharing in the nature of fire means being capable of burning things. And so a pan, if you put it over the fire, begins to share in the nature of fire because it can burn the food that's placed inside of it. So if the father produces a son by nature, then the son doesn't have the father's nature unless he also produces a son. And then you have not a trinity, but an infinity of persons, right? You would just have this infinite progression of persons because each one mm -hmm. is producing a son by nature and that son shares perfectly in the nature of the father and so on and so forth. Yeah, and the only way to get around that is super clever speculative arguments by Richard Swinburne, really lesser versions by people like William Lane Craig. And I've got a whole paper about why those are totally unconvincing arguments. So I'll put a link to that in the blog post for this episode. It seems to me the only way you can do that is to deny that the son shares totally in the nature of the father, or else to say that it's a divine nature to subsist in three persons, but the father is only a part of that nature. And so we're returning again to the, to the earlier argument. Yeah, they want to say that the divine nature results in another divine person and another divine person, but the way they try to argue it is that there's some divine perfection such as not being lonely or being perfect in love. For some reason, there has to be exactly three of them. <laughs> so they try to stop this infinite ball rolling. We have to stop it at three so it doesn't go to four. But um, these arguments don't work. They're super clever. It's as clever as Trinitarian theology gets. But I urge that these arguments always have a premise where you're like, why should I believe that premise? So yeah. if that's so, then the whole argument doesn't really convince. In these arguments, is the idea that it's the Father's nature that he needs two other people for him? No, it's just that the divine nature requires being perfect in love, and that requires exactly three, is what they have to say. So that's still true of person number two and person number three. But then once you meet three, for some reason it doesn't have to go on to four. Well, it sounds to me like in that case, the Father also would be posterior to the nature. Uh, his being a father, I mean, not his existence, but maybe, but his being a father would be explained by something about the divine nature. Yeah. This implies giving up divine simplicity, because then you have to distinguish between the person and his fatherhood, which is against the idea that the only distinction between the persons are their interpersonal relations. But actually, you have this irreducibly distinct person who later becomes a father because of the nature. Yeah, I think that's right. Someone like Swinburne or Craig just doesn't want divine simplicity for a whole bunch of different reasons. But I think you're right. And maybe that's why these arguments didn't occur to anybody early on. Well, the reason why they don't want divine simplicity is because it's impossible to come up with the doctrine of the Trinity if you have it. But if well, they give that up too. divine simplicity, <laughs> I mean, if you give up divine simplicity, you're just as uncatholic as I am in that respect. Yeah, people will push back about quite how much Catholic tradition demands when it comes to simplicity. Many say, think it's obvious that it demands the strongest kind of simplicity imaginable in others. Well, like William Hasker, they just, no, we don't have to have simplicity. We have to have processions and equal divinity and the shared usia and everything and the three hypostases. But we don't have to have simplicity because, come on, that's just incoherent. I think they're trying to have their cake and eat it, too. They want to be called Catholic, but they play fast and loose with what's actually Catholic. Yeah. Well, having your cake and eating it, too, that's part of the human condition, my friend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dr. Nemish, thanks for talking with us. Thank you for having me. This week's thinking music has been the track... Phoenix by Koi Discovery. As always, there's a link on the blog post for this episode at trinities.org where you can listen to and download that entire track. Also, be sure to check out that blog post for links to Dr. Nemish's other interviews and to his books, including this one entitled Trinity and Incarnation, a Post-Catholic Theology.
for listening. We'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind.